Let's start out with an example of a problem that comes to us naturally as a tensor. Well, let me back up. Let's start with a problem that comes to us naturally, period. Then discover that there's actually a tensor behind it. This is actually the way that most of the interactions with tensors actually go. The concept of a tensor is a little bit slippery, and while there are shortcuts that make it sound simple, you'll do best to remember that there is extra artifacts that we must check and, and justify when we're dealing with tensors. There's an entire video that I'll show you of situations that look and feel like tensors, but really ought not be thought of that way, including various popular things that you'll find in blogs and software development tools, such as TensorFlow. The concept of a tensor is much more nuanced than what you might think of from pop science. Knowing that is not to say you can't use the word tensor however you like. It simply means when you invest in understanding what a tensor actually does, you get a much more powerful tool. So let's take a look at an example that I love to speak about. These are called chat room tensors. Really all they are is examples of labeled data. Whenever I label data, I'm making a measurement of something. I might measure how often a student comes to class, an attendance chart. I might measure their grades in a grade book. In this case, what I'm going to do is measure over time individual users with various names against the words that they use. My dictionary might be quite large or quite small, but whatever I do, I can label my data this way. I can even think of clustering the types of data together if I have some dictionary understanding. But let's not put too many constraints on it. For now, it's just labeled data. The conversation happens in a chat room. Well, if you don't like the word chat room, just think of a message board, reddits, whatever, blogs, just a place where people interact and they create text or videos or conversations. We take the labeled data and we slice it into time slices. Each time slice gets labeled by when it happened. The result is that everything that's measured in here is some sort of a frequency chart, such as zero laughs from user D, three laughs from user C, and so forth. We fill up a grid of numbers. And that's somehow the right way to think about a tensor when you first encounter it, is simply some grid of numbers. But there's a catch. I can make a grid of numbers out of many things. I can make a grid of numbers out of the stock market. I can make a grid of numbers out of where the bus stops are. But not everything is susceptible to linear algebra. What we'll add to the world here of making it tensors is that when I make this grid of numbers, it has a vector space behind it. Now let's see where that's hiding in this chat room. When I look at these keywords, they have some intrinsic meaning. But what I'm trying to understand is what they mean when they're combined together. To combine them together, let's think of these as basis vectors, just coordinates in some n-dimensional space. If I use one word often together with another, that would be a linear combination with a higher scalar value on the word that's used most frequently. These types of linear combinations then form a vector space we'll call the verbal vector space, the space of the words that are being used and how they're used together. Changing that basis is to change the words with subphrases, maybe even gibberish in the sense of it's just a machine listing of these words. They're not full sentences, but they capture the way that we might manipulate and see if we combine these words. Is that the topic of conversation, this combination? So already we see a justification for taking this axis of this grid and describing it as a vector space with an implied basis that we started out with when we labeled but now we're getting rid of that basis in exchange for a more interesting basis. The same thing can happen with users. We're not necessarily interested in individual users when we're collecting data. We might be looking for patterns, groups that work together, or people that tend to be with one group, and sometimes, in a little probability, with another group. So once more, we can create a model in which our data has these axes also as a vector space. This will be our users. And as our users interact with our verbal space, they produce different slices of time. Now time itself may surprise us as a vector space. Now, surely we can think of this. 
unit one, unit two, unit three as being different units of time. But what would it mean to have a linear combinations of times? Well, there are plenty of applications where you shouldn't be doing such things. But the point is to say, does the questions we might ask allow such a question? And there is at least one where this is a natural thing to do. When conversations are occurring simultaneously, you're sampling from people sending out tweets overlapping each other, the conversations are actually spread out over time, mixed in with multiple other side threads. Whenever you have this sort of interaction, you need to start thinking about a linear transformation that brings this to a different basis, combines the time in a new way. This here can also be a vector space. So we have three spaces that label our axes. So not only is this a grid, but it's a grid which is a bit like Jello. We can change the sides. It's not a grid that must be kept rigid. We're going to change the basis of all three of these sides of our grid, and that is when we cross the threshold into tensors. If all we did was keep it like a sterile bus chart, we wouldn't call that a tensor because Permuting the stops on the bus, rescaling them, and taking linear combinations would certainly confuse any bus rider and would be absolute foolishness. You wouldn't attach a vector space to a bus schedule, but it does make sense for this application of discovering conversation topics that we take linear combinations on all three sides of this tensor. Now, later on in the course, we're actually going to study this precise example and adaptations of it in the form of a clustering question. That is, we'd like to separate the different conversations that are going on simultaneously. This has actually been a topic of study for about 60 years. Surprisingly, it's not one that started out in data sciences and statistics. It actually occurred in old mathematics known as the finite simple groups. That'll come up in a weird story, but it doesn't matter. The point is, mathematics is a tangled web. You benefit from learning from various fields. Tensors being something that transport themselves well amongst fields are often the carrier of these connections. Let's look at another example of a tensor where the same idea has to be going on. We're going to have multiple axes framed together. We'll call that the reference frame or simply the frame. And each one of those axes is labeling some vector space. We'll get into more of the subtleties in a minute, but this one already did that. Let's see if we can produce another one from a completely different field. Okay, behind me is a drawing meant to be a flat sheet of paper, like a disc. And then there's a point that we're going to add to this disc to take the disc, combine it with a point, and turn it into a sphere. But a sphere can be drawn lots of ways. There are many spheres that are just, say, a tissue box shape. There are spheres that are perfectly round like a tennis ball. Then there are spheres that look a little bit like my snowman back here. What's the missing ingredient that we need to describe this? The answer, perhaps surprisingly, is a tensor. Now, it's one of the most old tensors out there. And so, in some sense, the notation that we have for tensors owes a lot of it to how we ended up writing these sorts of equations. But that takes a little bit to unpack. The full formality can be found in a couple of great sources. First, I'd recommend something as simple as Calculus on Manifolds by Michael Spivak. It's a wonderful short book that takes you through the tour of the kind of geometry that you need when you want to think of these sorts of curvatures. The second source I'll put in the link is a video by our own Clayton Schunkweiler that went through a very nice description of the tensors that appear in geometry. It's a really short walk through all the topics in a way that feels engaging and quite colorful. Without saying too much, let's say the ingredients that are necessary here. When I create a topology such as the box, the tissue box version of a sphere, just the shell, not the inside, that's completely indistinguishable from my snowman on the level of topology. Because topology, after all, doesn't care about where things are, just how they're connected. If you look at a train map, it's often drawn with the stops on a straight line, but the track curves all over the place. They're topologically the same, but they're quite different graphs. When you actually travel, there's curvature involved. Now, when I do this, the missing ingredient is known as curvature. And the mathematics to explore what curvature really means, it's a bit technical. It's calculus that so you can understand. And we won't go through the details, but we'll go through the big summary, what it is that we need as a basic ingredient. What we fundamentally want to understand 
is why something is rounded. Let's take a point right here and let's suppose in our imaginary minds that we've drawn a little post-it note on top of this dot on our piece of paper. And as we take that and deform it into the shape that becomes our snowman, our post-it note goes with us. Now that post-it note is meant to demonstrate the concept of a tangent plane to this surface. It doesn't have to lie on the sphere any longer. It just has to lie on that point, just like the post-it note is stuck somewhere and it could flap around. But that tangentness is something we want to take advantage of. If I was to take and intersect along this curve along my snowman through this point, I could imagine that I have a local derivative on that line. And that derivative I could write on that tangent space. In fact, that's what the tangent space is there to do, is to collect the derivatives in all those local directions. Now this is two-dimensional, so there's only two directions that I need in order to span that entire post-it note. That is, there's only two derivatives that I need to know about. They don't have to be at right angles or anything special. Now what should we call these? There's lots of choices, but the ones that we seem to stick with the most are notations like partial derivatives in the x and the y direction, or other coordinate systems. These are simply basis vectors of the tangent space. In a formal sense, they don't mean anything. And in fact, we know that. When we do the integration, the little dx isn't some number. It's just a placeholder for a formula that means, that means to undo the derivative. Nevertheless, it's a catchy notation. These are just vectors placed on the tangent space that span that whole space. But now what do we want to do is combine these effects. Notice we could take derivatives multiple ways. Take the x, then the y. Take the y, then the x. But there is an issue going on here. There is some kind of cancellation. What we have going on is known as cycles and co-cycles. When we try to think about how things are moving around, if I come back to myself on a cycle, I would want that to cancel out. I could contract that away to nothing. In that same way, what I create when I put all these different derivatives on there is a chain complex of cycles and co-cycles, depending on the context of whether one way or another, dual or non-dual. Because of that, that means that I have a plus minus system going on in all my summations, an alternating sum. And so the right thing to do when combining these partial derivatives to create higher and higher derivative powers is to combine them with a cancellation property that's alternating. In particular, if you use the same letter twice, that will be zero. This is the boundary condition. The boundary done twice is zero, is the hallmark sign that you're doing something with cycles or something related to derivatives. Now I'll let that be a topic for another class, or for the videos I'll point you to. But let that be the situation we're starting with. Now what we want to do when we take second and third derivatives is combine them by some mysterious product. This product has to have the property that dx dx goes to zero. And that sort of fights our intuition. So we change the notation with a brand new product symbol called the wedge. These go to zero. These, therefore, go to their minuses when we swap them. If you add them together and distribute, you'll see that that's the only way that you could actually make them both satisfied at the same time. This is called the wedge product or the alternating tensor product. It's an example of a fixed basis for all the various powers of derivatives that we would take when doing integration or differentiation on such surfaces, often called manifolds. From these things, we can start to write down the data that's necessary to describe curvature. For example, I might notice that in order to describe a shape that looks like this versus a shape that looks like this, a second derivative test is quite useful. That second derivative is the information that I'd like to store to describe that the curvature did something different. In that sort of test, what I now store are the linear combinations of these basis vectors. I make vectors that look like this. If I use different coefficients and add different values, I'm able to study, oops, I should have given powers to this, i and j, there we go. Okay. If I do this, I can keep track of all the combinations that give me the curvature that I'm interested in. And this then stores a bunch of data in a grid. Doesn't that sound familiar? 
when we were doing the chat room data, we had to store data in a grid. The same data is being used here, but it's being used in what we know as a sparse notation, meaning we just write the terms that are non-zero. We just write it as a sum. We don't write it in the grid. But if we choose to order the basis vectors into a grid, we will get a grid back. This is the source of the tensor notation that we have today. These values here got stored with subscripts and indices that would later be known as matrices and tensors. And now every place that we see matrices and grids, we call them tensors because they relate back to this tensor product. By the way, historical note, before that, the notion of tensor that Hamilton came up with was all in the service of quaternions, which was his darling. He used the word tensor to mean something that's the length of a quaternion. Why? His main idea was, if you have some kind of quaternion, the length would be how much you'd have to push it down by to get to length one. You'd have to stress it, tense it, to make it shorter to have length one. So the tensor being the length was just the right name to come up with. He also invented words like verser and vector and vector space and many other words that are used elsewhere. That said, the length of a function, or I mean of a vector, is often a very different looking symbol. This doesn't look like a grid of numbers at all. It doesn't look like anything related to this. However, as it transpired, the various calculations that used length were not left only in the quaternions. They soon used larger dimensions, and the lengths needed larger numbers of grids to describe things like Hessians and other values. So it soon became the name for anything that was taking something like a value out of a grid, a norm, an inner product, anything like this, was superficially called a tensor. By the time that Levishivita and Ricci came along, tensors were simply anything with a grid. Okay. Let's move from here into physics. You may think that coming off of the geometry and curvature, the right thing for me to talk about next is Einstein's curvature. The curvature of space is what Einstein used to model how gravity works. It's a wonderful topic. But as far as tensors go, it's rather on the bland side. It's a pseudo-Ramanian inner product. One, 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 three spatial vectors, and one hyperbolic for the time vector. That's not impossible to use or, or too difficult to use. It's sort of just one step away from being the obvious thing to do. That said, I don't want to discredit its value, but I want to surprise us with something even more surprising with vectors which occurred at the same time. Heisenberg. Heisenberg was hanging around Copenhagen and trying to understand what on earth quantum mechanics really was. What are the mathematical requirements? How can we make some sort of model that describes what these things might be that we can imagine in our heads? Before then, people had all sorts of ideas, including things like springs and small gears. He was trying to understand how we could make these things work that would fit the experimental results that Born and other people were making. Excuse me, Born, not Born. Born as well. But. What he came up with would later be called matrix mechanics or Heisenberg mechanics. And it got derision because soon after a differential equation was discovered by Erwin Schrodinger, and that was pretty popular at the time. People had, in fact, invested about 50 years studying differential equations a la Cauchy. So it was hard for them to jump into a new type of mathematics like matrices. Now, most of us understand both of those topics with equal fluency, and we find the value of both techniques in understanding quantum mechanics. But I'm going to stick to the matrix interpretation so that we see the tensors come out front and center. They also can be done from the Schrodinger equation, but it's much more investment in the thinking. The key idea that Heisenberg tried to interpret was that whatever was going on inside of a quantum system, it was relating to other quantum systems by entanglement, which we understood but didn't understand even by a name at this time. Key idea might be to start with something like an atom. If you have an atom, it can have its nucleus, and then it has shells of electrons. These different shells have strange properties that Bohr really studied. When you have bonding, there is a pair of electrons that can hang out together in one particular orbital. Only a pair can hang out together. 
and it was finally Polly who understood why this was always a pair, though Bohr had a lot of the main insights. What Polly observed was that electrons have special properties that never change, like their charge, their mass, which is zero, and then there had to be some extra property that would allow them to be compared to each other. If they were both the same, he argued, they couldn't be in the same place. They would need an auxiliary parameter. And this became known as the spin. The spin, unlike charge and mass, can change. And we'll see why in a second and what this means to the world of tensors. Since spin can change, it allowed one electron to be spin up and another spin down. Together, they would make an orbital that could coexist together. Now, what the spin word does is it conjures in our head things like a spinning basketball. You spin it on your finger, and you can see an equator and an axis. But these are electrons. They don't have mass. They therefore don't have a diameter. There isn't something spinning. Why the word? Well. If we think about what's going on inside of a ferromagnetic material, like a bar magnet, there's not a bunch of moving electrons like a current. It's electrically neutral. You couldn't use it as a battery, and yet it stays magnetic. What's going on in that situation? Well, the situation is that the electrons themselves have an intrinsic magnetism. But magnetism, at least as we understood it by the field equations of Maxwell, has to be in the presence of moving charges. Whatever that means, it means that electrons have to be somehow creating some magnetic field by motion. And you can then measure whether that magnetic field induces a north or a south pole in some orientation. Ergo, the electron has a spin in the sense that, like a dynamo spinning, it produces a magnetic field in some orientation, and that spin can change. That's not exactly right, and the numbers are always off by two. But that gets sorted out in the details. Let it be said now that there is this quantity called spin that allows two electrons to, in a sense, magnetically glue together like north and south poles do. When this happens, we get an orbital. Whatever model in your head that is, it now gives us the initial ingredients to do some interesting mathematics. Let's consider that we make a vector space with a basis out of these two creatures. Now I'm going to use some notation that was invented by another physicist, Paul Dirac. What I'm going to do is glue together these two basis vectors. These are called kets. And the notation will become more useful when I give a lecture on what bra ket notation means. But for now, think of it as a version of this story, only now we've replaced you with the symbol arrow. And because we're already using arrow in some way, we just need to put a symbol around it to say, I am a vector. For now, you can think of it like an arrow, however you wish to think of it. It's the notation we'll be using. So this two-dimensional vector space is gluing together these two possible spins that an electron can have. So whatever an electron is, it's an element of this two-dimensional vector space. Well, at least if we ignore these two constant values. The parameters we need are all here. Now, there's a few subtle things I should say here, for example. There's also an inner product that's Hermitian on this vector space, and that everything in here has length 1, so it's a projective argument. If you don't know what those words mean, it doesn't matter. What we have now is the concept of creating one particular electron that can have one of this position, or have this position, one of these two basis vectors. We'll come back to what it means to have linear combinations in a minute. If I have a second electron, it too can have one of these two states. So it too is in a vector space that's two-dimensional. And the question then becomes, when these merge into one combined thing, what is the corresponding vector? And this takes a while to work out. Certainly it takes experiments. But the surprising thing is that the right model is to take your vector space C2, your vector space C2, and combine them into two by two matrices over C by taking the first vector paired with the second vector and multiplying it by u, v, transpose. I'm assuming the vector is written as a column. So I'd have an a, b, and a c, d, producing for myself an a, c, a, d, b, c, b, d matrix. 
As a quick side justification for what's going on, we can think of these values as probabilities. Actually, they're the square roots of probabilities, but that's a detail. This is the probability that our electron is behaving like a spin up, and B is the probability that our first electron is behaving like spin down. When we actually measure it, one of these two will come out. It's just more probable that it's this one or that one. The combined probabilities, therefore, are to multiply all these local probabilities to see the effect combined. That's why matrix multiplication is exactly the right tool to describe how these two electrons entangle their probabilities. This is the birth of matrix mechanics. You take the simple operation of matrix multiplication and it starts to give you the way that probabilities spread out. This would later be replaced with the Schrodinger wave equation, but it's the same notion. Describe the probabilities where things can be on mass. Once you have this, you realize that you need to come up with a very useful way to think of these grids. We've already decided that grids can be thought of as tensors. And so the multiplication, which had already been used for tensor products, became the name for this combination. In particular, when you entangle two quantum effects, you're basically just taking a tensor product of things or linear combinations of them. You are, after all, in a vector space. And this brings up the key point that makes linear algebra hard, or sorry, multilinear algebra harder than linear algebra. Let's take a look at the vector we just created by this first initial combination. It is a matrix that's two by two, but we could row reduce this. Notice that this is always a multiple of A, this is always a multiple of B. So if A is non-zero, I can divide by A and use negative B to clear that. It'll clear the whole bottom row, producing a matrix of rank one, or perhaps zero if the initial values were zero. Because the matrix has rank one, Consider that every matrix in here that's hit by this function could only have rank one. But there are plenty of matrices in here that don't have rank one, like the identity. So these functions are not surjective. Therefore, what is happening is that some very special situations are particles that come together and don't interact. They're rank one. But as soon as they interact in linear combinations that are proper, producing say rank two or three or higher, now they become entangled. And this teaches us something about how likely that is. Most matrices don't have rank one. So the idea of particles being on their own is pretty unlikely. Just about every particle is entangled with some other particles somewhere in the world at some point in time. It's just the probabilities stacking up. That's an extra episode. But what we need to think about now is that we want to extract properties like this in higher valence. What do I mean by valence? Well, we don't always have just two particles to consider. Maybe we have three, four, five, or many other particles. When we want to combine several particles, maybe we'll have them initially in up and down. These could continue in timelines and become merged over time through translations that make them into a mixed particle that's now entangled, which could then be combined with this one over time to produce an even larger combination of these things. Where does this all take place? Well, we take this two by two matrix and we add an extra C. And what we reach is now gonna have two by two matrices, two rows, two columns, and two depths. I'll just draw what that might look like. But values that we write like this tensor are exactly the ways to model these delicate entanglements of three particles. This gets way out of hand if you just keep drawing it like this. We'll soon start to use little pictures. For example, we'll draw a triangle to indicate a polygon that has three different axes. So one particle is connected here, another one here, another one here. The tensor here is now involving them all three. These, what are called tensor network diagrams, are enormously useful chips they certainly allow us to draw bigger dimensions. For example, I'd be at uh, really struggle to draw anything bigger than a three-dimensional box, but I can always draw a box like this, and now I'm talking about four particles at once. Here's five particles at once. These are all just pictures of tensors in higher and higher and higher valence. Whatever you do to draw this, keep in mind it would always help your audience to pause and experiment with them. You should not expect everyone to understand what your picture means.
backing up to even the grid, even this can be confusing at times to understand. And you can always stop me in lectures to ex have me explain it too. With these combinations, we now see how we moved from the data, which was very naturally grid-oriented, chat room tensors and the like, back down to the older world of geometry, where curvature needed to coordinate a huge grid of numbers to describe curvature. We slid over to physics, and physics here has the examples of tensors that have applications, at least to the world of quantum mechanics, and there also are older ones in geometry as well. Now I want to move down to the world of mathematics pure. Things like algebra, topology, other situations where they just had tensors all along and didn't care who was using them. And so we're now going to take an example from the world of algebra. Now don't get frightened away, I'm not talking about extreme examples like group theory and so forth. This will be algebra that you've known from your experiences in undergrad perhaps. Complex numbers, a plus bi, they really are knitted together with the plus sign so that we understand how to do their arithmetic. But at the background of our minds, we recognize these really are just coordinates, a comma b. They're elements in the complex plane, which is really just the real plane. Now, what do I want to explore in this product? I'd like to see how we multiply complex numbers. And there's a reason for that, which we'll see as we devolve or evolve our conversation. If I look at the multiplication of a plus bi, was c plus di. If I want to expand this out, well I have strange rules, at least in the US system, where we learn things like the FOIL method. But that's not really what's going on. Let's keep a visualization of what's happening. Whatever a plus b is, it's some length a, and then we added some length b to it. Now, of course, these are not correct pictures when we have these in th two dimensions, but that's where plus was originally meant to be, just the length of two sticks. If I want to multiply the length of two sticks by the length of two other sticks, then I just simply draw a picture like this. Here's A, here's B, here's C, here's D. And the whole point of multiplication was to tell us that the value of this product could be, dis or sorry, the distributive law, was to tell us that we could work out the value of this total area by adding up the values of the smaller areas. AC, AD, BC, BD. And this is the first example of a multiplication table. You would have learned this at any stage in your you know, elementary life. Now when we add i, we certainly perturb what we're doing. If we're honest to what we're just doing, we're just doing multiplication of length times width partitioned into spots so that we can see how to do it on smaller pieces. But we follow the consequences through all the way. Whenever I take i squared, I start to remember what i was there for. i was there for it to be the square root of minus 1, or rather, that its square would be negative 1. And so I'm able to rewrite this as just minus. Now if you stare at this information, you may not see a grid of numbers. Or you might. Take a look very carefully at this being in a two-dimensional system. Do you see it? Notice that this coordinate and this coordinate lie in the range of 1 on the x-axis. Meanwhile, this coordinate and this coordinate lie on the y-axis of the complex plane. In particular, if I separate these into linearly independent parts, I start to see a three-dimensional picture emerge. In the front, I have filled in values here I have a times c, here I have negative bd. Then in the background I have adi, I don't need to place the i, that's in this position, this is in the one position, and behind here I have bc. If I was to draw this in another format, you can start to see that the values are taking on the shape of a 2D by 2D, or sorry, a 3D 2 by 2 by 2 grid. In particular, since A, B, and C, and D are varying over multiple things, I can't fix it down. But if I fix particular values, like a basis, 
or their ones, then I can see that I would just need to store a matrix at the very front with one and minus one, telling me what is happening in this first slice, and behind it, a matrix which is 0, 1, 1, 0. And you know this already. If we were to write this multiplication table with 1i and 1i, 1 times 1 is just 1, i times i is minus i. This is the first slice of this multiplication tensor. And here is i and i. The two matrices have been superimposed in the multiplication table. And this, in fact, is vice versa. While it may not seem so immediately obvious, absolutely every single multiplication table over an addition, if it distributes over addition, it is actually just a tensor, a grid with multiple axes. And conversely, every single grid with multiple axes is just a type of multiplication, which is distributive. And this brings us all the way back to this need for tensors to have more structure than just being grids. Notice that in order to relate a grid of numbers to a multiplication that's distributive, the axes better have an addition. The multiplication is the tensor itself. The distributive law, however, requires us to already have split up lengths by an addition, and therefore we have to label the axes by something which we can add. Now the addition of a vector space is actually over the top. We don't need vector spaces. We can make tensors out of just ordinary abelian groups and various other things. But that's a generality that's there just for the people who need it. The idea of using a vector space to label the axes of a grid allows us to connect it to the distributive law. Once we connect it to the distributive law, every single grid of data that we collect in this way has a story to tell in the world of algebra. Why should you care about that? The world of algebra is the computational arm of mathematics. Think about it. What equations do you solve? Even differential equations set up polynomials, linear equations. Each one of these systems we then solve by the techniques of algebra. Algebra is just a bunch of tools to test how to solve an equation. We have to set up the equations and decide which ones can be solved. There's also a lot in there. When we solve with algebra, we have several techniques. For example, one of the techniques we have is to make enough numbers to guarantee a solution exists. 2 plus 3 equals 8, but 3 plus what equals 1? We'd have to invent a negative number to get there, and so we have to build new numbers to do it. Square root of minus 1 is perhaps the most noticeable example of creating a number just to make sure you have solutions. So part of algebra is designing the numbers you need. The second part of algebra is deciding which equations can be solved. Today that's known as algebraic geometry because the way to know if it can be solved is often thought of by how the shape of that curve is. And finally, then there's the algorithm builders. How do you actually find a quadratic formula or some other more sophisticated algorithm, Gauss elimination, linear programming, or other things? Now, I'm not suggesting that the only people who do computations are algebraists. I'm simply describing that at the high level, the world of algebra is designed around study of equations and its solutions. So, to the extent that tensors can be linked to the world of algebra as distributive multiplications, that's a boon for us because it accesses all the tools of computation and lets us solve for stuff. And you've already been seeing this whenever you did things like eigenvalue theory. You took the distributive property and you used it over and over and over and over again in order to build a polynomial whose factors would tell you how this data is oriented. Now, I can't say that this has covered every possible way to see tensors. But I hope it's illustrated that the topic really is smeared around multiple questions. The questions we're going to cherry pick for this particular course, we're going to try to think about questions that study how do you see clusters in data. That's a pretty natural thing to start studying. After all, with linear algebra, we took matrices and we block diagonalized them, or read them as diagonals. That's the first version of clustering. We're going to do more general versions, and it gets considerably harder. If we move to the world of geometry, questions that are in there have a lot to do with whether certain types of um, symmetries exist. Do you have a way to rotate something? Is your curvature sort of smooth or locally uh, invariant? These types of things have to do with what are the symmetries of a tensor, the isometries, and so forth. 
If we move to the world of physics, some of the many applications include what are the possible entanglements? Are there some minimal states that we could create interesting materials with? Quantum phases of matter is a developing area that very similar to phases of matter like liquid and solid is showing us that we can create quantum states that are like liquids, liquid crystals, all kinds of strange shapes that let us do new technologies. And at the foundations of that is how do you wire together these tensors? And then in the world of algebra, there's a number of questions that emerge that are simply of the form, how do we minimize information, dimension reduction, what's the boundaries, what do we get that's an approximation, and lots of questions that are just purely on the mathematical scale interesting. I'll let you drive your interest throughout this. I want you to speak up and tell me what you're most interested in, but also reflect on what other people are interested in and file them back in your mind. Maybe someday you'll see an insight that lets you connect to something that you weren't even thinking about. That's the joy of mathematics. The network is quite broad and it really deserves to be studied altogether. Okay, that's a crash course. I don't expect to test you on any of this. Just be aware, you could, if you invest enough time, find yourself starting out, say in algebra, and ending up in a physics problem, or beginning with a differential equation and ending up solving a data science question. However these connections happen in your own mind, that's for you to explore, but it only works if you participate with others. See you next time.